typically it starts with a set of questions that the instructor develops. And the term that is typically used is called warm-up questions. Some people have developed cute and catchy names for these. For example, the physics instructors at the Air Force Academy call them pre-flights. So they get their students to do their pre-flights. I call them geobites and dinobites, and I'll explain those in a little bit. Uh, but it, typically, it's a warm-up exercise. So it's something the students need to do before they get to class. It can be very short, just three to five questions. And we'll talk about questions in a little bit. They could be multiple choice. It could be short answer. But again, the idea is something that students submit before class begins to get them to think about the content or process content that you've already given them before they come to the lecture. So it requires them. So of course, you have to grade it then, which we'll talk about the grading in a little bit too. But it's the only way we can hold students responsible for that and making sure that they're engaging in it. What's nice is that they use the technology to submit it. I, as an instructor, set the deadline for them to submit it either the night before a class begins or some people do it two to three hours before their lecture begins. And they'll scan through the student responses. And you can get a good feel, OK, the students understand this concept. They don't need to spend a lot of time on it. Or if I'm explaining um, in geosciences, let's say I'm explaining plate tectonics and divergent plate boundaries. And I go through that, and then I give them an example in a just-in-time teaching exercise. And in class, it looked like they got it. But then when they left class, three days later, they're submitting this. And it's, it's completely wrong. The students are all over the place in their answer. That lets me know, OK, let's, let's revisit this now before I build upon this basic concept as the course continues. So students submit their responses. I review it. Maybe I need to adjust my lecture that day. Maybe I don't. Maybe it can go on to something else. And the nice part is that I can review what students have submitted with them to show that, yes, OK, we're on the same page. No, this is what we're going to do. I can then integrate their responses. I can build that framework that, again, connects to what my goals are with the course. So geobytes are for my, some of my geology classes. This is a, I teach a course called Environments of Africa. And for this course, I rely a lot on online resources. Because there's no textbook called Environments of Africa. There's not a book out there for the sciences that works. So what I do is we have an online course management system at Penn State called ANGEL, which is very similar to Blackboard, WebCT, where I can put links to pages. I can insert quizzes. I can insert discussion boards and such. And with the Environments of Africa course, you'll see here for this weekly exercise that I do with just-in-time teaching, I have lots of links to National Geographic articles. One of the reasons I like the National Geographic articles versus the Journal of Volcanology or something like that is that this is something my students can access outside of the class and even after the class is over. Having them read peer-reviewed journals is not a goal or objective that I think is good for a gen ed course for me and my students. But Discover Magazine, Scientific American, these are written for the general public. And I would love my students to be able to understand and feel confident and comfortable reading these materials even after the course is over. So I linked to articles, and, and these are some pretty fun topics. Uh, this particular week, we were talking about the Sahara Desert. And you'll see one deals with camels, and one deals with crocodiles and rock art. And, and elephants are always a big issue, especially in Philadelphia, since we're shutting down our elephants at the zoo. We're getting rid of that exhibit. And then what I do is I will have a link to the exercise. And what's nice when in, I'm sure Blackboard has this as well, you can have things up here and then hide. So students can't submit it late. <laughs> So therefore, once 11, or I had it before this semester, I was actually teaching in the morning at 10.30. So once 8.30 hits, boom, it's gone. They can't submit it late. So the first question, was the Sahara always a desert? How do we know? That's not something they can easily just look up in one source, too. This is something that it's going to require a little synthesis. It's going to require a little time. It's not going to be where they can just open up one article and get this answer. So it, it's going to take time on their part to pull it together. Second one. Modern day animals can be found. How do, they, how do they survive? And then why have humans past and present gone into the Sahara Desert? Why, the whys, hows, those types of questions, getting students to think about the content. Think about what you've done in class and get them to think about it on their own before you bring the students all back together after they've done this exercise. So this is an example of the week that I do the Sahara Desert. And these questions are a little bit more of an extension now. Again, I'm teaching a geology course. Talking about life in the desert is not necessarily directly related to geology, but it's something that they're going to be a little bit more interested in than what's going on with the groundwater system underneath the sand. 
I talk about that in class, but I want them to also, again, kind of explore and try to connect with what's going on. It's a chance for them to learn something a little bit more. So I like to use geobite exercises sometimes as an extension beyond what I would traditionally cover. In physics and math, I know, again, at the Air Force Academy, they will just give, give it as problem sets. They'll give more problems to, again, reinforce and make sure students can work through the process. But then they submit their responses. I go through them. I review them with the students, their responses. And then there's always some sort of follow-up activity, some way that I can get the students to kind of talk to each other and engage after we review the answers. And this kind of extension activity also connects with the desert. Um, I call it the pack a truck exercise. Because I do, it sounds horrible, but being a science person, I've got to get them doing math because their math skills are extremely weak. But I want them to be comfortable with math and realize that there is a use to it as well. And so what I do is I've proposed a scenario that we are going to go into the Sahara Desert and dig for some dinosaurs. And this is being done now. Actually, Paul Serino at uh, the Field Museum in Chicago has been finding the super croc. Did you hear about that? That's the crocodile. It's the size of a city bus that got dug out of the Sahara Desert. And so we'll talk about you know, things that can come out of there and why it's useful to go there. But if you're going to plan an expedition to the desert, what do you need? OK, well, my students have just read these articles about the desert. What do you need to live in the desert? We'll brainstorm that. We'll write that all on the board. Then I'm like, OK, we're now going to go to the desert. And I'm going to give you, you're going to have 16 people on your team. You're going to have four trucks to pack with your materials and supplies. Uh, here is the roof of your truck, but it can only hold 200 pounds of material. Here's the front cab. Here's where the back of the, the truck where you're going to put your materials. You need so much plaster, because we said you need that to protect the bones that you dig out. You're going to need an emergency road kit. You're going to need a medical kit. And you want to put the jack in the back of the truck in case you get a flat tire, because that always happens. <laughs> and then I get them thinking, OK, what is the weight of all this? And how are you going to distribute everything in your four trucks with 16 people in their tents and how much food that they need? And then once you're in the desert, how much do you, in fossils can you bring back with you when you're done? So they think about, OK, how much gas has been consumed, how much food has been consumed. And they all say, well, we're going to lose a lot of weight, aren't we, if we're working in the desert? <laughs> so, uh, but, but it's fun because they've read these articles. They've read about life in the desert, how hard it is, what the conditions are, how much water they want to bring. So it's, again, a, a way for me to extend and kind of build on some of the skills I want these students to learn. I want them to learn or be more comfortable with math skills. They've learned these math skills. They don't realize that they can do it. They just need more practice with it. And then it's a fun way for them to think about, again, uh, life in the desert, and whether they actually want to go and do these kind of paleontological expeditions. Are they ever going to go to the Sahara Desert? Probably not. Hopefully they'll get out of Pennsylvania, but I don't think they're going to get to the Sahara Desert. But it's, again, a, a, a nice exercise to kind of pull things together. 